let's assume that we're trying to determine the power in a general RLC circuit. Let's take a look first at a resistive circuit. We know that if we're given a sinusoidal voltage source, and assuming that it has a phase shift of zero, we can determine the current through just that resistor as V over R. That gives us a current with an angle of zero as well. We know for resistive circuits that the current is in phase with the voltage as shown. If we take a look at some of our general equations, we know that we can use the power as V squared over R, I squared times R, or V times I. We have V times I, or Vm, Im, times the cosine squared of omega t. If we plot out the power, in the upper graph we have the voltage and the current, both shown for this resistive circuit. We know that they're in phase, and so the instantaneous power is plotted here, Vm, Im, times the cosine squared of omega t. We have the period is twice the period of each individual voltage or current source. We also have the power itself, the instantaneous power for resistive circuits is all positive. No negative values, everything's positive there. Cosine squared gives us all positive values. If we determine the energy, we know that the energy is just the integral of power over time. That positive energy flows continuously from the source to the load, just like we would normally associate with a DC um, source with a resistor. The resistor dissipates that energy as heat. No power ever flows back to the source. If we take a look at the average power, we see that halfway between zero and Vm Im, or the peak power, half of that is just Vm Im over two. We could also calculate that by using the RMS values. We know that the RMS, or the effective value, is just the peak over the square root of 2 for both the current or the voltage. We could use our calculations. It can actually determine that it is 1 half V sub M times I sub M. If we continue on this path of determining the power, and again, we're moving towards a general impedance, not just a resistive impedance, we want to look at inductive circuits. A source, just like before, where our angle is zero, we're solving for the current, we get the current has a phase shift of 90 degrees. We plot it, and we can see that, that the voltage leads the current by 90 degrees for inductive circuits. Looking at our equation for power, we have the peak voltage times the peak current times the cosine of omega t times sine of omega t. If I take cosine times sine of the same frequency, I get 1 half times the sine of 2x. So therefore, um, my final equation for power, 1 half peak voltage times the peak current times sine of 2 omega t. If I plot that, our peak is basically positive V sub M, I sub M over 2, to negative V sub M, I sub M over 2. The average power is 0. Some ideas about power in an inductive load. We know that basically power is coming out of the source half the time. And so when the power is positive, the energy is being delivered to the inductor. If the power is negative, the energy is being delivered from the inductor to the source. So unlike a resistive element, we have energy actually being returned to the source for inductive circuits. We call this idea of power due to an inductive element reactive power. The reactive power is going from the source to the load. We know that it's positive for inductive circuits, and we could actually plot that as shown here. I'll talk a little bit more about that after I talk about capacitive circuits. So let's take a look at capacitive circuits and power for that. Here we have a capacitive circuit. We know that the impedance must have a, a phase or an angle of minus 90 degrees. The current, therefore, must have an angle of positive 90 degrees. We have the voltage and the current plotted for capacitive loads. Where the current leads the voltage by 90 degrees. We could use our equations that power is V times I, negative 1 half V sub M times I sub M times the sine of 2 omega T. Looks very similar to our inductive circuit, except now that it's negative. We know the average power is zero. 
that the peak positive is V sub M I sub M over two, that the peak negative is negative V sub M I sub M over two. For capacitive circuits, when the power is negative, the energy is being delivered to the capacitor. And when the power is positive, the energy is being delivered to the source. If we plot out our uh, reactive power for capacitors, we see that it is negative. Before we move on, I just want to come up with some general equations for a general load. Now we have combined our resistors and our inductors and our capacitors all into a single element, an equivalent impedance. We know that we can write that as R plus JX, alternatively in phase or form a magnitude of Z with an angle of theta. Deriving the equations for power, again, we're just going to use our standard equations for voltage and current. We can come up with an equation for power. And the most important thing, we can go through the derivations with the math, but uh, the main things you have to remember is that the average power is one half times the peak voltage times the peak current times the cosine of theta. The average power could also be written as the RMS voltage times the RMS current times the cosine of theta. So what is this theta, this cosine of theta? It has a special name. It's called the power factor. The cosine of theta is power factor. And it's defined as the angle by which the current lags the voltage, or theta sub V minus theta sub I. We have here, just looking at the graphs, we know that for inductive circuits, the current does lag the voltage. And in most industrial situations, we have much more inductance due to motors because most industrial systems have very large motors and motors are mostly made up of inductors. We generate power factor. The power factor is the angle by which the current lags the voltage and it's the cosine of theta. If the power factor is positive, it's called inductive. If the power factor is negative, it's called capacitive. Taking a look at our power triangles, we see this angle theta. We know that for an inductive load, we have theta being positive, and for a capacitive load, we have theta being negative. If we take a look at the horizontal axis for both the capacitive and inductive, that it's labeled P, or real power. The units are watts. This is just V times I. This is what comes from the resistance, right? It's all real. This is the power that's actually used. We notice that along the vertical axis, we have Q, our reactive power. And reactive power has its own units called VARs. This is that imaginary power coming from the inductors or capacitors. It's the power that we want to get rid of. We know it comes from motors. We know that we have to handle it on the transmission wires. And then we also have the hypotenuse of the triangles, the apparent power, and notice that is just the RMS voltage times the RMS current. 